And we are back on The Chosen Journey with Steve Carsey. And we are now on chapter 11. Um, during our break, I talked with Steve and uh, Steve does have an idea of where he's coming. But uh, in one of our previous chapters recently, we talked about the life on the 2002 New York Yankees. And I got to say that when we clicked off that uh, one of the recent chapters and Steve had, an, I had a good conversation uh, again, you know, on that topic, you know, we talked about first round draft pick. Then we start talking about the New York days. I'm like, Steve, we got to turn the, the recording back on, buddy. This is too good. It's like, Oh, you want to hear about this stuff? People care about these things. I'm like, yes, they do. <laughs> so what we're going to do today is the chapter title is the 2002 New York Yankees. And after our discussion, Steve, I went back, I looked at that roster, but it wasn't just a few like all-stars. This team was stacked, like seriously stacked. Like the reserve players would have been starters on any other team. Like, wow. Well, why do you think I signed there? Because I feel like I had an opportunity to win, right? After 2001, I became a free agent, as we talked about in one of the past episodes. And looking at my options, I felt like, you know, okay, I can sign the contract, but I can also have the opportunity to win for not only 2002, but beyond. So yeah, uh, great players to play with, uh, great teammates, and, uh, you know, just super competitive uh, going out there on a daily basis. It's, it's just fairly, it's just not, not fairly incredible. It's beyond incredible. And each position, it just player after player after player. So I said to myself, you know what? I would love to hear Steve's perspective on these people, not necessarily the inside dirt. We don't need to know who's sleeping with whom and what's going on. But what we want to know is, you know, what were they like as teammates? You know, we know the names, we know the stats, but man, what were they like in your estimation? And I can tell you from a fan's perspective what we thought of the day. So I'm going to kind of skip. A, first of all, we're going to start with pitchers, obviously, because that's your bread okay. and butter. And we're going to go alphabetical. Some of the interesting guys. The first guy, of course, is number 22, Roger Clemens. Great guy. You know, uh, obviously had an opportunity to, you know, to play with him, but we had the same agent. So going over there, I knew Roger a little bit. Uh, you know, again, you know what you're going to get. You watch his work ethic. You watch what he does every fifth day. Uh, you watch how he competes. Um and you, you can't just help to try to, you know, uh, be like him in, in the way that he goes about his business. And uh, whether you're a reliever or a starter, you know, you watch him perform and, uh, you know, you just watch greatness uh, before your eyes. Did he have a hand in recruiting you? No, no. I, I didn't get recruited, to be quite honest with you, from anybody. I didn't get any calls from, from anybody like they do today. It was mm -hmm. just one of those things where... I told my agent to go do do his thing, and uh, the Yankees were, you know, one of the the teams that called him. But I, I'm sure that my agent had a few guys on that team, so he had a real good relationship with Brian Cashman. And when the Yankees are interested, you listen. It's kind of funny about Roger, you know, because you know people think whatever they think of Roger. You look at those stats, and I remember him in the Toronto days, and like just unbelievable. Like the guy was just money in the bank, and. As far as a teammate goes, never heard anybody say a bad thing about the guy. No, I mean, what is there, to, what is there bad to say about him? I mean, you know, obviously some of the stuff that he went through uh, with the government and all of that stuff. But uh, at the end of the day, when, when he walks between the, between the lines, you're going to get a, a competitor that, uh, you know, you want on your team. And, uh, you know, he's just one of those guys. He's like a Nolan Ryan. My impression always, the man brings his lunch pail, he comes to work. That's it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, just exactly what he does. And, you know, he's out there for his team. And, you know, he wasn't a five and dive guy. He was one of those guys who went out there and tried to complete the game uh, and went as hard and as long as he could until the manager took him out. You ever see a more competitive guy on the mound besides yourself? Uh, uh, it's hard, it's hard to even bring one up. I, there's a lot of competitive guys that I've played with. John Smoltz is super competitive. Maddox is super competitive. Uh, you know, uh, Jarrett Wright was super competitive. I mean, there's a lot of guys that I played with that were, that were really competitive, but you could just see it exude from, from Clemens. Smoltz's reputation was competitive in everything, especially the golf course. No, no doubt. I mean, Took everything you've seen seriously. It in, yeah, absolutely. You can play a video game with him and he's going to be super competitive at it. So, 
yeah, he was, he's one of those guys as well. There's a reason why his jersey's always in the background when we're having Yeah, he's one of the guys in the back, absolutely. Next guy, one of my favorites watching. I loved his uh, his whole uh, demeanor is uh, on the mound. Is uh, I just I love his delivery. Orlando Hernandez, number twenty. El Duque, El Duque. Yeah, Duke. you know, came from came from uh, Cuba, right? I mean, Yankee signed him. Uh, again, you know what you're going to get from him. He goes out there. He's going to pitch once every five days. You're going to get different angles from him, different pitches. Uh, and just uh, another guy that's uh, a really good teammate. You know, again, you know what you're going to get from him. Uh, you're going to hear me say that a lot because the guys that sign with the Yankees, it's almost like a, a lawyer's office. You go in there, it's quiet. You come there, you do your business, and then you leave. And that was like what the Yankee clubhouse was like. I was so shocked and heartbroken because I've always been a Yankees fan deep down. Like as far as in heart, a baseball fan, I guess to say. Just because of those pinstripes, pinstripes, and the and the history, if you love baseball, like even even if you don't love the Yankees, you gotta admire it. You just the lure of the Yankees. And when he got traded, I I couldn't believe it. And he got traded uh, to the White Sox for I don't know, Mister Esteban Loiza. Oh, Esteban Loiza. I think he's in jail now. He is in jail, correct. Uh, smuggling drugs in the car. He was watching a little bit too much Narcos. So uh... <laughs> Esteban was a funny guy as far as uh, people used to tell me meeting in the hotel and he used to clown around as far as autographs, not autographs. But uh, at the time, I, and I wasn't, I admit, I didn't, I wasn't a huge Loiza fan as far as just generally everything about the guy as a pitcher, but respected the guy for what he was. But I couldn't believe that they would trade El Duque for him. But El Duque at the time, like, was like the whole and also this was different back then when you're coming over from cuba right and with him and levon uh over on the marlins at the time yeah it, it was a way different world and it was a very big deal to get out of cuba and, no uh, doubt did they ever talk about no, those stories was. uh no i mean he wasn't one of who was fluent in english as well he spoke mostly spanish in the clubhouse and he knew a little bit of english but uh you know through interpreters you would hear some of the stories that you know, how tough it was over there and under the regime when they played. And then, you know, when they had the opportunity to, uh, you know, get out of Cuba and come and play professional baseball in America, that was a lot of their dreams uh, for the players over there. And now you see more and more guys doing it. I got to tell you, like going once in my life to Cuba, staying actually in Cuba, in town, going to the supermarket there, like there was nothing on the shelves. Like, like there's two boxes of cereal. There's barely anything over there. And, and it, it's, not, I don't know how much has changed over the years. Like you're, you're going there and you're looking at the cars and everything. Have you ever been to Cuba? I have not been to Cuba. It's like going in a time machine. You literally feel like you're back in the fifties. Like nothing has changed. Like they have not evolved at all in so many ways when you're actually in town. So I can't imagine what it'd been like for him to be able to leave as he did, but he put, he made himself a nice career at the end. Uh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, El Duque was, uh, a, a quality pitcher and uh, again, another competitor. And that's what I loved about these guys. Another guy, uh, interesting dude, number 41, Sterling Hitchcock, a, a guy that probably got lost and shuffled a little bit with the, with as far as the names go, but he was pretty highly touted and uh, really highly thought of uh, as a Yankee. Yeah, he was. I mean, he, he pitched for them for a long time. Uh, you know, nice left-hander with good stuff. Um, you know, he was probably the sixth starter at that particular time when guys got hurt, he filled in the rotation. Otherwise he was in the bullpen, uh, you know, great conversations with him. You know, we would talk baseball, um, and you know, he always wanted to start, but he knew with the other five guys in front of him, he was going to have to get his opportunity. And, uh, you know, he plugged in here and there and had a great career. Just one of those things, like, I, I, I hate to use the word utility player, but utility pitcher, but a guy that a championship team needs. Is that fair? Absolutely. Yeah, of course. You, you always need you, – you need all 13 pitchers on that team, uh, no matter what team you're on or 14 pitchers these days uh, because there's so many innings to – valuable innings that guys need to chew up. Um, you know, you hope you have starters that can go seven innings all the time, but that's just not the case anymore. No. And, uh, you know, when he went out there, there was no pitch count on him. And, you know, uh, he went out and he did his thing. A next guy, a guy who would be a number two, maybe like, if not number three, for sure, on most staffs, he's probably number eight on this staff, 
But uh, interesting dude again, Ted Lilly. Yeah, Ted Lilly, another uh, you know solid guy, California guy. Uh, we lived next to each other in 2002. Uh, I think uh, you know we touched on a little bit of a story with Ted Lilly. Uh, I was living in the Trump Tower at the time, and uh, Teddy came over, grabbed a quick uh, you know drink at the in in the apartment, and then we popped on the elevator, hit the elevator button to go down to jump in the car to go to Yankee Stadium. Elevator doors open. We walk in. We stand next to this gentleman that's standing right in the middle of the elevator, right dead in the middle of it. We kind of split them and go on either side. And Teddy looks at me and he looks at me twice and he goes, and he points and he goes, and I'm like, he goes, excuse me, sir. He goes, who are you? And I'm sitting there and I'm like, oh my God. He goes, are you Harrison Ford? Harrison Ford turns to him. He goes, yes, I am. And he turns back. And that was it. Elevator got to the bottom floor. We walked off, <laughs> got in the car. He walked off. And I was like, oh my God, that was just Harrison Ford. <laughs> like, you know how many movies I've seen of this guy? Uh, but, uh, you know, Lily was like in awe of Harrison Ford. But, uh, you know, it was a neat experience. You know, again, I get into these elevators and I don't really look around to see who's in there, but Teddy knew who he was. And uh, I wish I had more time. I wish I could have been able to talk to him a little bit more about some of his movies. But uh, we went on our way and he went on his way. When you were telling me that story, I was thinking he was going to turn around and say, don't you guys pitch for the Yankees? But no, it was just, I'm Harrison Ford. Yes, I am. And that was the end of that. <laughs> that and was like, the end of the story. Were you guys are, 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 like there was nothing coming out at this point? I think he wanted to say something else, but we had just hit the first floor and the doors open and Harrison got out of there as quick as possible. Any idea what Harrison was doing in the building? I have no idea. No. He might have lived there. I mean, he, a lot of people lived at the Trump Tower uh, on, 60, on 58th Street by the UN at the time. And that's kind of where I, I ended up my first year. Uh, I thought he was a visitor for maybe one of your teammates in the building. So we'll he, he could have been, he could have been, he could have been coming from the 88th floor where Derek Jeter lived at the time. 88th floor with Derek Jeter. So uh -huh. we'll get to him in a moment, but uh, so you were not to be clear. Cause we were talking about this uh, before we went on the air, you were not crashing on Derek Jeter's couch. You weren't hanging with Derek Jeter in the apartment. You had your own place. Derek had his own place. That is correct. Uh, I lived about, 54 is below where Derek lived. So, uh, you know, he did his thing. I did my thing. And obviously, you know, we were friends and playing with the Yankees and we would, we would talk and, you know, maybe have a drink here or there, but, uh, you know, it, it was just one of those things where I had no idea he had an apartment in the Trump tower. I just, that's just where I ended up going and finding a place when I lived there. And, and he was a, a tenant there. How cool would his story have been if you said uh, Derek got into the elevator and Ted goes to him, hey, wait a minute, aren't you my teammate? Aren't you Derek Jeter? Yes. Yes, I am. <laughs> but So Derek would acknowledge you in the elevator, you're saying? Yeah, Derek would say hi if I popped in the elevator and he was on his way down. I wouldn't expect anything less. So back to the pitchers, an interesting dude that comes up next. I thought he was another versatile utility. He was like a, like a Swiss army knife as a pitcher. 55, Ramiro Mendoza. Mendoza. Yeah, great. I mean, he was a jack of all trades, right? He could pitch him in any position from the fifth inning on. He could play, he could be your long man. He could give you an inning if you needed to. Uh, and, and he was really a staple of that ball club for a long time before I even got there. So, uh, you know, it was just, it was great to play with somebody like that because that's kind of what I was as well before getting to the Yankees. And that's what I did with Cleveland. I'd say one of the most underrated uh, pitchers on the Yankees from that era. And that guy saved your bacon for that team so many times. I remember Mendoza comes in and he just got the job done. Absolutely. That's, that's what he did. And that's why he was there for such a long time. Anything particular as a person, as far as uh, reflections? No, I, I believe he was from Panama. So, you know, he was another Spanish speaking guy who spoke some English and uh, you know, it was just one of those things where, you know, we would talk baseball and we would go about our business and say hi to each other and uh, be good teammates. 
go to the next guy. We were talking about Roger Clemens before. We want to talk about 1A, 1B, 1C as far as these starters. The Moose, 35, Mike Messina. Wow. Yeah, quiet. Quiet guy. Stanford guy. Dry humor. But tremendous individual overall. I got the locker kind of next to him Mm -hmm. across like this little pathway. He was on one side of the pathway. I was on the other and really had an opportunity to learn a lot from him. I mean, really quiet, like I said, but very knowledgeable about his craft, about what he did, and uh, just very consistent with his routine. And now you know why he's in the Hall of Fame and he's had so much success. He pitched in the American League East for his whole career, right? For, with Baltimore and the Yankees and those little parks and to put up the numbers that he did and, and to do what he did uh, throughout his career. Uh, and only win 20 games in his last year in the big leagues. What a tremendous uh, individual and a tremendous honor for him. He was so incredible in Baltimore. I remember him with that all-star game in Cito Gaston. You know, it's funny how those little things are so meaningless and stupid, quite frankly, but can stick to somebody afterwards, you know, but watching him, like, you know, being based out of Toronto, Ontario here and, and getting to watch him on, on both teams, like the man was just a grinder and just a pleasure to watch. Just real professional about it. Any team would have been lucky to have him. It was so weird to see him not in a Balter uniform for so long. Yeah, it was. But, uh, you know, like I said, he signed that seven-year deal with the Yankees. And uh, that was a tremendous sign for them. He was another guy who really stayed healthy for that whole contract. The length of that contract, his elbow flared up a few times. But besides that, you knew that he was going to take the ball every fifth day. Uh, you knew he was going to give you 100 to 110 pitches. And uh, you know he was going to keep you in the ball game and give your team a chance to win. So where we talked about 1A, 1B, 1C now. So we got Clemens, we got Musina. It's just so unfair. I, you guys should have won f- five World Series in one year with this freaking team. Oh, my God. 46, Andy Pettit. Are you kidding me? Another great individual. A uh, guy from Texas. Uh, another... Alan Hendricks client, uh, you know, another golfer uh, who loves to play golf, but, uh, you know, left-hander, put him in, uh, in the two hole. Again, you know what you're going to get from him. Uh, when he got to the playoffs, uh, just a competitor and pitched so many big games for the Yankees throughout his career from the time he came up in 96 uh, throughout, you know, the time he left and, and went to Houston. But uh you know, he, he's a guy who, uh, you know, is a gem. Uh, you just love to watch this guy pitch every fifth day because he, he had a, he's one of those guys who really started instituting the cutter more often and it became a thing. And guys started trying to copy how he was pitching because he would get in on right handers, uh, and try to get the ball away from left handers, but, uh, big six, six guy, thick, you know, and uh, it, it, it shows you like a guy like that, right? He was drafted in the 17th round. So just because you're drafted in the first round or the fifth round or and he was in the 17th round, you can still become, uh, you know, uh, a great icon in a great city like New York. And it goes to show, you know, how unfair it is because it's, you know, a uh, blessing of riches. If he, he has to get in the 17th round, makes it on the team, of course, it's got to be the Yankees out of everybody. But another guy that you know, had his history, obviously, but never heard a bad word spoken by a teammate about him. No, Andy is uh, is, as professional as they come. He's he's one of those guys who, you know, he goes home to his family and kids and really love them. And then he would come to the ballpark and compete, get his work in. And then, uh, you know, after the game, take off and and go back home. So uh, that's who he was. And, uh, you know, it's... uh, it's nice to see those guys in the game. GM at the time for the 2002 Yankees, you recall? Brian Cashman. I, I, he's, yeah, that's right. I, I, he's been around forever, you know, but it goes to show you also, they were not that dumb when they're putting this together. It's not just a band of all-stars. You start to see a pattern. Professional, good guy, good teammate, works hard, goes about his business properly. It's interesting how they all follow. I don't think it's any coincidence that these people got put together. No, no, absolutely not. And Brian's been there for a very long time. I, I, I believe Brian started as a bat boy in the Yankee system and, yeah. you know, well, ended up know doing a couple of different things and, and worked his way up. So 
you know, he's he's been a lifelong Yankee as well, like uh, a lot of those players. You know, George Steinbrenner was a, a tremendous man uh, before his passing. I got to spend some some time with him when I was hurt and, and coming back from my shoulder surgery and rehabbing in Florida. And he would always come in and watch the games in the in the coach's room there. And, uh, you know, I've I've had some interaction with him, which was which was tremendous. Is he, is he the way they portray him on Seinfeld or is that a bit of an exaggeration? He's a tough cookie. Let me tell you that. Let me tell you that. I mean, I can tell you one story real quick if you'd like. Of course. It's all about stories, buddy. All right. All right. So, so here's the story. I, I'm rehabbing my elbow and uh, I get done. I come in and uh, I'm in the, in the coach's room because the big league rehab guys, they put them in the coach's room there just to, be away from the, the, the fracas and the fray of the minor leaguers. So I, I come in, I pop in, George is in there. I'm like, Hey boss, how's it going? You doing all right? He's like, yeah, doing well. He's like, cars. He goes, come here. I got a couple questions for you. I'm like, all right. I'm like, shoot. He's like, Hey, he goes, do you play basketball? I said, yeah, growing up on occasion, I, I played basketball, you know, a little bit in the streets. He goes, did you play football? I'm like, yeah, I played football some. He goes, what about hockey? He goes, I said, I loved hockey. I played hockey. Oh, my God. He goes, well, damn. He goes, you sure don't play baseball. And I was like, oh, <laughs> is that a hint, boss? <laughs> so it was one of those things where he really liked to get on you. But, uh, you know, he would see how hard you were working and you're trying to get back. But uh, the guys that he signs, he wants in New York and he wants them to compete. and He wants to win as bad as anybody that I've ever seen. Did and you ask me, is there anybody more competitive than Roger Clements? And I might have to say Joint Steinbrenner was more competitive person about winning uh, than, than Roger. I got to imagine like when Vladimir Putin goes and plays hockey and he scores eight goals or 10 goals in a period or whatever it is, you know, because of course he did that uh, and nobody's going to not uh, let him score. I, I imagine it's the same level of respect when Steinbrenner comes into the room. <laughs> or pretty close It is. To it. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, he commanded respect and, and of course you'd give him respect because of, of what he'd done. You know, the man, all he wanted to do was win. And that's why he spent so much money signing players is because he wanted to bring the best players in and try to bring championships to New York. And man, he had good stories. There was a story after story after story. Well, we got to get to our next player now. And it's uh, for yourself. We know you and we're learning about you, you know, every single week, but on any other team, pretty much you're going to be the closer, but on this team, for whatever reason, they decided they're going to go with another guy. Uh, you may have heard of him, number 42, Mariano Rivera. Yeah, he was there for a long time, too. Came up in uh, 96, 95 or 96 as well, and was just a staple in New York. I mean, again, another professional guy, another guy who went about his business uh, every day with getting his work in and preparing for the games and doing what he needed to do. And then when his number was called on and you heard enter Sandman, you felt like you were in a really good spot. How awesome is it to set him up and then have him come out and hand him that ball? Just Yeah, it was on. great. I mean, you know, you pitched the eighth inning and, you know, in a close game. And then, you know, Mariano comes in after it. and You pass the baton to the next guy. And most of the times you, you knew you were going to win that game. And a guy that always had a smile on his face. Like, did you ever see him get angry? No, never got angry. Uh, never pitched in spring training either. But, uh, you know, it was one of those things where that's what that was his routine. And that's what he did. He would throw bullpens through live BPs, do that. Maybe pitch one or two games in spring training and then go into the season. So, uh, yeah, just a, a, a joy of a, of a person. Uh, a great player, uh, another Hall of Famer that I was had the opportunity to play with. Uh, I played with a lot over my career, and I was very fortunate to be able to do that and uh, and learn from those guys. Was it, uh, you know, as far as when he got injured and filling in for him, I mean, there must have been some thought into it as obviously going into the Yankees, but like when we talked about it off air, we talked a little bit on in one of the chapters, the decision at the end of the day come to the Yankees was win, win, win. 
That's right. They were going to go with who they thought uh, was throwing the ball the best at the time. And if I was, uh, it was me. If it was Mendoza, it was Mendoza. If it was Stanton, it was Stanton. Uh, at the end of the day, they just tried to put the guys in position to win and, and for the team to win. And, uh, you know, obviously you got to you got to think that the uh, AL East is a really tough division. So every win that you can can gain uh, during the year in that division uh, and spread yourself out and be in first place is, is always a good thing. Number 29 was next, Mike Stanton. And uh, he didn't change his name to John Carlo as well, right? He did not change his name as well, but he's another guy. Like, listen, like this guy, you go back and look at his stats. Like this guy pitched a lot. I mean, for that team, any left-handed hitter that came up that the, the Yankees needed him and Torrey needed him. He was up loose, ready to go in and he took the ball all the time. So uh, just another guy who uh, was a great Yankee in, in the late nineties, early two thousands and uh, you know, did the job that he was brought there to do and, and did it well. I, I think he pitched 140 games that year, if I'm not mistaken. It sure it's a felt lot of even- games. I'm telling you, it's hard watching as many games as I did of the Yankees that year. It's like you feel like him and Mendoza were in there every single game, pretty much. And they probably were. I mean, that's just the way the Yankees and Joe Torre ran it. Uh, and that's the way Steinbrenner wanted it. If you're going to pay your guys X amount of dollars and the game is calls on them to come in and pitch, then they're coming in to pitch. So I think the Yankees decided that year, we're just going to have two pitching staffs. So we're going to just carry 10 starters should be starters on any other team and starter number eight or nine at this point, but was a top starter on, on his previous team. Jeff Weaver made it onto this team. Yeah. Jeff Weaver was on that team too. Uh, another guy got him from uh, Detroit. He was in Detroit and then came over to the Yankees and uh, his brother pitched for the angels. Uh, you know, really low key guy. Didn't know, you know, a, a California guy. Right. So, yeah. Uh, I believe he was from California, but coming to New York, a little different, a uh, little different vibe for him. Um, so he was a little bit more quiet and, uh, you know, went about, a, went about himself in his own way and, and minded his own business. How do you like the haircut? Did he mention that? No, he didn't mention anything about any haircut. Because I'll tell you right now, those sideburns you're sporting now would not have been allowed on the Yankees, my friend. Oh, yes, they would have. As long <laughs> as you don't have any facial hair, you're good to go. There was a joke. There was a joke that came out of The Simpsons with Don Mattingly was on The Simpsons, and every episode, Mr. Burns would come to him and say, "Get rid of those sideburns." And eventually, there was no sideburn whatsoever, <laughs> and he still kept telling him. So yeah. that was kind of a myth. Those sideburns would have been allowed. I believe these sideburns right here would have been allowed. Yes. I think as long as you're getting guys out, I think they would have been all right with it at the time. I don't know about that because they make guys shave a little bit on the sides. But uh, Jeff, Jeff uh, I, you know, did he bring kind of comedy or looseness a bit? Or did he kind of, in that kind of room, he just kind of kept to himself? Well, he wasn't near my, uh, my end of the room. But, I mean, he kept to himself. I mean, he just, again, went about his business. But he was, he was interactive. I mean, you talk to him about baseball. You talk to him about pitching. Uh, everybody learned from each other. And that's, I believe, why we were so good. And starter 1D now. <laughs> <laughs> this guy made it on. I'm like, you, again, I was looking through this right after our episode, uh, our chapter the other uh, week, and I'm reading this. I'm like, that's right. He was on there, even though he got traded for Clement. He made it back. Number 33. I was at his uh, first major league game, Boomer David Wells. That's right. Boomer was there. And he, everybody knows the stories about Boomer. And I would have to say that uh, the majority of those are true. He really liked to go out and have a good time, uh, but came to the ballpark and pitched his tail off. I mean, he had one of the best breaking balls that uh, I've seen from the left side and uh, just was real smart about how he went about his business and and pitched on the mound. But, uh, you know, you can't ask for any more than any of those five guys. You, You can mix and match them however you want, but if you send any one of those five guys to the mound every fifth day or any seven of those guys every fifth day, you're in a good spot. Like people expected you guys to go 162 and 0 basically with this, with this uh, rotation and boomers, a guy, you know, you imagine he's going to show up at the ballpark on his Harley, you know, 
he's going to be coming in, you know, cracking a couple beers during uh batting practice. But no, that, that was it. When he came to the field, you know, even though he had that fun loving spirit, uh, he was a damn hard worker. eh? Yeah, he was a hard worker. He loved to listen to his music loud when he pitched. I think it drove Joe Torrey crazy. Uh, because he would have hard, heavy metal blasting throughout the clubhouse, and it would basically just be him in the clubhouse with the with the Bat Boys and everybody listening to the music. Everybody else scampered out of there when he was pitching because his music was just blaring as loud as can be. Uh, was that the year that he pitched the perfect game? No, I was not there for that. That was uh, I don't know what year that was that the perfect game was. It was before two thousand and two, though. But that was the year that he wore the Babe Ruth cap. Babe Ruth cap. So he yeah. says. So he says, you know, <laughs> but it's a good story. It's one of those things. That, it's a great story. But if there's anybody, if you think about anybody that would go and buy a Babe Ruth cap and wear it and pitch and also be drunk at that game and pitch a perfect game, would it not be Boomer? It would be Boomer. He did like, he did like to toss a few back. Yeah. Uh, was he fun? Did you get to hang out with him uh, after games? Did you guys? Uh, were you, yeah, were you I had a really, I had a really good relationship with him. He took me under his wing when I got to the, got to uh, Toronto. He was in Toronto, and, yes, and yes, when I was there. So I got to stay with him for a month or so at his house, and he let me stay there. And we play catch and play golf and do all that stuff when I was a young guy. And he would kind of just talk to me and teach me uh the ways about going about things and and how the big leagues were and it was just it was a lot of fun wow how old were you guys at this point would you figure oh god they had to be 93 yes for me so uh that was shoot whenever whenever he was with toronto and then so almost a decade later, you guys reappeared together, the Yankees. Like, what was the first reunion like? Like, did they give them give you a bear, bear hug? Or... Oh yeah, it was great. Of course. I mean, I mean, we, we, and the thing is, is like when I was with Oakland and he was pitching in Detroit. Like when I got to Detroit, we would hang out and I'd go to his house and and do that kind of stuff and and shoot the breeze with them. So, you know, I mean, you can get a bad rap sometimes with with what the media tells you, but. Uh, down at the end of the day, he has a genuine heart and he's a really good guy. And there's a lot of stories. I mean, there's a lot of stories that came up from when he was a rookie and on and his upbringing. But again, it's like that folklore of it's one of the great things about baseball. Baseball is all about stories like, uh, you know, uh, when you're a young kid growing up and you're reading the back of the baseball cards, you're reading like all this stuff about, oh, this person like is into skydiving. This person climbs mountains in his spare time. A lot of that I'm told afterwards is not actually that true. <laughs> some of it is, some of it's not, right? But with David Wells, it's probably true. So that that rotation at the end of the day, like, you know, four guys can go down and you still got yourself a top start five. Like it's again, top to bottom, that pitching staff. Wow. And we did not know a couple of people, including Randy Choate was in there as well. Yeah, I mean, the left-hander, he had a long career as well. And, uh, you know, when I got over there, he wasn't used as much. But, uh, you know, it's the more that uh, he got trusted, they would they would use him in, in situations there. I mean, they had Mike Stanton. So, you know, it's really hard uh, as a guy when you're, you know, maybe the 12th or 13th guy on the staff and you got that rotation and then you got the guys in the bullpen who come in after him. So it's when we when you assess it at the end of the day, when we when we end up finishing the roster, it's interesting because you know everybody just gives the impression that the Yankees bought, you know, try to buy themselves a championship, but there's a lot of homegrown guys at the end as well throughout the roster. Like there are guys that were drafted, there are guys that showed up, like you know, through the minors, and it isn't just all free agency and trades. No, think about it. I mean, Mariano Rivera was homegrown, Andy Pettit was homegrown, uh, Posada was homegrown. Derek Jeter was homegrown. Uh, Bernie Williams. I mean, you just, uh, that's five starters right there and a closer that uh, were, were homegrown, especially, uh, you know, they had Gene Stick Michael doing their uh, scouting and, and a few other guys who are high level scouts at that time for trying to find, you know, these players to, to draft and to develop. It's a combination of, you know, you have, at the end of the day, you know, you can't have a $2 billion payroll. So at some point, you have to be able to carry some homegrown guys, but also 
you need that talent to be able to pull those trades at the deadline because you can't just trade beer cups for them. You know, they're, they also got to be chips in much the same way. Uh, Ricky Anderson found his way to Toronto at the end of the day, and you had to make your way to Oakland. So that's the nature yep. of the game at the end of the day. It is the nature of the beast. Absolutely. Of, uh, of getting players when it's time, if you're going to make a run at a, at a world series rank. So I hate to disappoint everybody, but I think our time is up. So what we're going to do is I think we're going to have to pause here. We went th- successfully through the 2002 Yankees uh, pitching staff and we're going to make their way to the hitters. So we're going to hear about them in another chapter. Sound good to you? Absolutely. Let's do it. Amazing, Steve. Oh, thank you always for the stories. Uh, our producer says, thank you so much. You're absolutely killing it. The feedback on your stories and man, you were born, you know, you were born to be a podcaster. You're born to be in a documentary and uh, you know, the attention you give and the stories to your fans, you know, the appreciation is there, man. So thank you for taking time out of your schedule for doing this. We successfully finished 11 chapters, believe it or not. And we got hundreds more to go. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks again. And I uh, look forward to the next one. Before we go, uh, let's take a look at the shirt there that you're wearing today. Oh, yeah. Look at that shirt today. Instead of the hat, I got this one here. That's right. Uh-huh. Look at it. You got the red one on. I got the, uh, the, the, the dark gray Heather one on. So he's sporting the merch and uh, no, no Brewers hat today. No Brewers hat today. I'll try to find, pull one out and find another one for you guys uh, on the next episode. Yeah, because uh, at some point we thought, you know, there's only Brewers hats in his collection, but no, there are other ones as well. I have other ones. Yeah, there's other ones that pop their way in on occasion. You always find a different hat. I always find a different shirt. There you go. Absolutely. Until next time, my brothers. See you for the next chapter. Thanks, Jonathan. See ya. Thank you, buddy. Cheers.